Hello everybody and welcome to day 11 of virtual learning. This video will be uploaded for Monday, March 30th and um, I will go over some things about the domestic impact of World War One in this PowerPoint. Friday's lesson, the one that you completed through Active Classroom if you did it, was about looking at some photos and those photos were touching on how the war was affecting life here in America. So I'll touch on that in this and also set you up for the assignment you're going to work on um, for Monday. I usually start this class off by listening to this recording from way back in 1917, the real recording, from a man named um, James W. Gerard. He was an American ambassador to Germany and it's called A Warning to German Americans. I'm not going to play it for you, but I'll go through a few things about his speech and talk to you about these questions. He says something like there are only two sides. What, what do we think he means by that? I also ask what would be his message for the foreign minister who says German Americans will rise up against the United States. Uh, third, what does he say will happen to any disloyal German Americans? And fourth, what's the tone of his speech? If you had been a German in America at the time, how would you feel about this? He starts off by saying that most of the Germans in America have shown themselves to be very loyal. And remember, as far as white Americans go, more people have German ancestors than any other European ancestor. So there's always been a huge immigrant group that descended from Germany or people that have German ancestors living in the United States. So he starts off by saying most have shown themselves loyal. And he says, I understood before we got involved in this war, if you had sympathy for Germany, totally understandable. But then he goes on to say, now that we've entered this war, remember the US enters in 1917, there's only two sides and you have to decide, are you an American or are you a traitor? No more having sympathy for your home country. He continues on and he talks about how he had a conversation with this ambassador who says, German Americans will rise up against you if you try to do anything and America will never make war with Germany for this reason. We have 500,000 German reservists. Well, he has strong words in response. He says, if you have 500,000 people, we have 501,000 lampposts, and that's where all those people will be hanging if they dare try and do something against the United States. And he says, if you're ungrateful, if you're from Germany and you don't like it here, we'll give you back your, your wooden shoes and your rags and hog tie you up and send you back home. So it's a very threatening message, very insulting too, really. He goes on to say he's been all over the country and he's never seen any animal that would kick and bite and squeal the same way a fat German American would if you tied him up and sent him back home. So as far as the questions from the beginning go, really he's saying now that the US is entering this war, you're either with us or you're against us. He threatens to hang anybody who tries to rise up against the United States. And anybody he says who's ungrateful or disloyal would be tied up and shipped home. And really the tone of the speech is, is threatening. It is intimidating. If I were a German person listening to this, I'd be scared. I'd be nervous about what might happen to me. And that would be a legitimate fear. During World War I, the suspicion of Germans in America being spies, being enemies, um, motivated all kinds of horrible things. There was this fear that the enemy would be lurking within. This cartoon is pointing out, if you are trying to hide in the United States, we'll find you. You'll be stripped. But there was so much fear and so much hatred for German Americans, they even became targets for attack. Many German Americans lost their jobs. Some were beaten up, tarred and feathered. One man named Robert Prager was actually lynched, killed by an angry mob. Even German music and books and language, they stopped being taught during the war. There was such hatred and fear of Germans. And it went beyond that. There are many words in the English language that are derived from German. You've probably all heard of hamburgers before. Well, that originates with Hamburg, Germany. So they stopped using that word during World War I. They started calling hamburgers liberty sandwiches. The illness that was known as German measles. They said, we're not going to call it that anymore. We're going to call them Liberty measles. If you've ever seen this, it's often put on hot dogs. It's called sauerkraut. That's a German word. Americans said, nope, we're going to call it Liberty cabbage. You may have seen these little dogs around. We sometimes call them wiener dogs, but the actual name is dachshunds, which is also a German word. 
they changed it and said, nope, we're going to call them Liberty Pups now. So all this fear and all this anger towards Germany actually even got people to stop using German words. We touched on, or you should have already seen, reasons why the U.S. moved away from being neutral and decided to get involved in World War I. Um, submarine attacks from the Germans were the main cause. And then that Zimmerman telegram, a message from Germany to Mexico promising to steal land away from the U.S. and give it back to Mexico, that was another thing that pushed us toward war with Germany. I will, in this section, go over things like the Great Migration, a new law called the Espionage Act, and how it affected people like Eugene Debs, all that's part of the domestic impact of War One. What you work on today will focus on the end of the war, the treaty that signed, and Woodrow Wilson's plan, the American president's plan, excuse me, something called his 14 points, and his idea for an organization called the League of Nations. So I'm going to have the organizer you're going to complete based on chapter 19, section 4, and the notes page attached as one document, you can just submit that through Verge once you have that completed. Um, later this week, probably Wednesday or Thursday, I'm going to upload a quiz for you guys to work on. Just like last time, it's going to be open notes because you're taking it from home, but it'll be based just on things uh, about imperialism and World War I. Okay, so probably Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday we'll think about it for that. A quick review, these are all factors that push the U.S. into World War I, even though initially Many people want to stay out. Even President Wilson, when he got reelected in 1916, that his slogan was, he kept us out of war. But all of these factors pushed America and the United States into the war. We had a close relationship with Britain and France. We were, the United States was giving them huge loans and selling them lots of materials. And once you have people who you've made huge loans to, the only way to make sure you're gonna get those paid back is to ensure they win. So we had a vested interest in the Allies, Britain, France, Russia, winning the war. The Lusitania, remember, was a British ship that was sunk by a German submarine. But there were Americans on board who were killed. That creates a lot of anger towards Germany. The Zimmerman note I mentioned before, that telegram from Germany to Mexico, one more thing turning us against them. And the fact that the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. They refused to stop attacking neutral ships. Um, they thought they'd be able to win the war before America was able to do anything to change the outcome, but they were wrong. The last thing would be that Russia had a revolution and they created a more representative government. That won't last forever. But when they did that, Russia, France, Britain, they were all democratic nations. We wanted to join on that side versus the monarchies of the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Germans. This poster should look familiar to you. It's used all the time now. But this version of Uncle Sam was originally created during World War I as a recruitment poster. He's pointing, saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. Why do they need this? Because the U.S. was not prepared at all when we entered the war. There were only about 200,000 men that were actually active duty service members at the time. We didn't have the officers. We didn't have guys with lots of experience in combat, so they really needed to work hard to prepare for war. They passed a law called the Selective Service Act in 1917, and it said that men between the ages of 21 and 31 would have to register for military service. There was a draft. It was not voluntary. By the end of 1918, 24 million men had registered, and 2 million were actually sent overseas to Europe before the war ended, so it was very successful in getting the soldiers they needed. A huge number of those soldiers were African American. There was a big debate in the black community. Should we go and fight for this country that's still not treating us equally at home? Some said no. Others said, well, maybe this will be one of the ways that we gain the respect and the rights that we deserve by demonstrating our value through our service. Um, women were also serving not in combat positions, but in the Corps of Nurses, um, in the Navy and in the Marines. One of the smart things the U.S. did to cut down on the effectiveness of submarine attacks was come up with something called the convoy system. It's basically like traveling in a pack. So if you have ships that are trying to deliver supplies like these merchant ships, you have military cruisers and big destroyers here. If they spot an enemy submarine, they can deal with that issue. They can attack it. 
they can defend so these ships are safe. Traveling in a pack like that really cuts down on the number of ships they lose. The fact that the U.S. entered the war when it did was very important. Because remember, this is a horrible war. Brutal. Trench warfare. New types of weapons really make it so devastating. And the countries that have been fighting, France, Britain, Germany, they've been fighting for going on four years. So American troops are coming with enthusiasm, with freshness. Other troops were demoralized. And that really makes the difference. They're able to turn the tide, so to speak. The timing was also key because Russia stopped fighting. They withdrew from the war. They had another revolution. And that's when Russia becomes a communist nation. And we're going to learn about that later on. Um, it becomes the Soviet Union, if you've heard that term before. But they stopped fighting in 1917 and made a treaty with the Germans. So the Germans are able to stop fighting in the eastern part of Europe and focus all their attention on the western front in France. So the U.S. arrived just in time to stop the German advance and turn things around. November 3rd, 1918, Austria-Hungary surrendered. Shortly after that, it's November 11th, 1918, Germany signed this armistice, this truce that ended the war. But how does the war affect things here in America? Well, some of the pictures you looked at, the activity that I asked you to do on Friday, should help you be a little bit familiar, but there are a few things that it didn't touch on. One is that the federal government increases its strength significantly. Um, President Wilson does things to make sure that the economy and everything in America is shifted to focus on providing for the war. So factories that may have been producing cars might have to be retooled and switched over to produce tanks. There are other examples of things that have to be done that we're going to get to. One of the ways they convinced people to support the war effort was by using propaganda. They're manipulating people. Now, propaganda can be for positive or negative purposes. In a war, typically the enemy is portrayed as being evil, monstrous, bloodthirsty. It's being used to convince everyone that it is our duty to fight and defeat this evil enemy to protect our nation and protect ourselves. Here's a good example. This was a real poster that was used at the time. Um, the King Kong gorilla here is supposed to be the Germans. And the message is, destroy this mad brute. You have to enlist in the army. Now, propaganda can take on many forms. Again, the idea is to get people to react emotionally, to change the way they're thinking or the way they're acting. It can be a painting, a poster, a cartoon, a sculpture. There can be movies that are propaganda. But during the war, it's encouraging Americans to do everything they think is necessary to win the war. A big part of that was food. To ensure that we could win, Americans knew, hey, we have to have enough food to feed our soldiers or to send over to Europe. So they created this agency called the Food Administration. Um, they're telling people in the United States, you have to limit how much you're eating. You have to conserve so that we'll have enough to send overseas to the guys fighting. They launch efforts to conserve not just food, but also fuel. That's when daylight savings time was first being used. They thought if we can change the clocks and have more hours of daylight, we won't use as much electricity and as much fuel. That really hasn't been proven to be true, but that's when it began back during the war. Here's another example of a propaganda poster. It says, food is ammunition, don't waste it. The message is, hey, the food that we have is just as important as the bullets and the guns. Our guys can't win unless they have the food. And the guy that was head of the Food Administration, Herbert Hoover, who later becomes president, said second to military action, food is the dominant factor that will win the war. Some of these posters were designed specifically to get people to save uh, items. This one says save meat for our soldiers and our allies, right? Buy fish, save the meat. This soldier is making an appeal. He says, we're saving you, you save the food. Well-fed soldiers will win the war. Here's a couple other examples. You did look at a picture similar to this if you did the activity in Active Classroom. It showed two kids planting a victory garden. So they encouraged people, you can save food by planting food of your own, or if you grow enough, you'll have enough to send to guys fighting overseas. So all these things were being done, being done during the war. People made huge sacrifices to ensure the U.S. would be successful. The other thing the government had to focus on was raising money. 
um, about a third of the money they needed to pay for the war because it's expensive, especially the farther away you are, was done through taxes. So income taxes, excise taxes, they put taxes on whiskey and things like cigarettes. But most of the money they needed was raised through selling Liberty bonds. And that's what this poster is saying. Help us stamp out the Kaiser. That's what the leader in Germany was called by US government bonds. So what are bonds? Well, bonds basically are an investment. So the government will give you a certificate that says you've invested a certain amount and it will take the money that you gave and spend it on soldiers, uniforms, boots, bullets. And then after the war, you cash in your bond, they'll pay you back whatever you invested plus interest. So in that way, it's beneficial for both sides. The government will have the money it needs right away. You have to wait several years, but you will get paid back and get a little extra. So you actually make money, which is why it's truly an investment. This was how the government got most of its money. It raised $21 billion through Liberty bonds. And that's something that'll be done during the second world war as well. In the beginning, I talked about how people were very scared of Germans within the US border and how they could be a potential threat. Well, the government was very worried about spies and threats. So it passed laws that will limit certain freedoms. Now, the ones you should be familiar with are called the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Espionage is like spying. Now, these laws say it's against the law to try and stop anybody from joining the army if you're interfering with the draft, if you're trying to stop somebody from selling liberty bonds, or if you make any statements they think are disloyal critical of um, the government, the constitution, or the US military. So basically they're saying you can't do anything to interfere with our war effort. You can't even speak out against our government or criticize our government. So right away, just like back when John Adams was president with those alien and sedition acts, people recognize this is violating the right of free speech. This goes against the first amendment. You can't tell people it's illegal to speak out against the government. But once again, during a time of crisis, the government is saying, this is necessary to keep ourselves safe. They especially went after anybody they thought was a threat to the government, like socialist and labor leaders. Now, Eugene V. Debs was someone I talked about in an earlier time period. He was one of these labor leaders, the American Railway Union he was a leader of. And he even ran for president at one time from jail got a million votes. So many people supported his socialist ideas. But he spoke out against the war and they sentenced him to 10 years in jail for trying to basically criticize the government, speak out against the war, speak out against the draft. He didn't serve that whole sentence, but it goes to show you that plenty of people were being negatively affected by this law and it was essentially taking away the right to free speech. These women were protesting saying, hey, Mr. President, remember the Constitution. We can't have any laws that violate the freedom of speech. Now we have people in jail because they spoke out against you. The other big factor that sh you should be familiar with, um, one of the major things that happens during the war, something called the Great Migration. Now, Northern factories, there's a huge demand for workers for two reasons. Many of the white workers either joined the war or got drafted and almost all the immigration from Europe stopped. Right? During the war, we're closing our borders. There are no more people coming in, not in huge numbers. So to replace those workers, many, many African-Americans were leaving the South and heading North. Now this is something that a trend that had already started even before World War I, but really accelerated during the war because there's such a demand for factory workers. And there are many reasons why black Americans want to leave the South. This map is just showing you places they left from, like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and then northern cities or western locations they headed to. So places like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, on the west coast, LA and Oakland, they all become destinations for African Americans escaping the south and heading north during the Great Migration. Um, one more thing I'll say about that. We have talked in the past about Jim Crow laws and voter suppression and all the things that people wanted to escape the racial violence in the south. The opportunities that were available in the North really encouraged people to leave even more so. And then we'll talk more about things like the Harlem Renaissance and why places like Chicago um, become centers of African American culture. I didn't put this in your notes, but the other group that really is greatly affected by this war is women. You know, with so many guys all fighting, 
women have to step up and take on the jobs that men left behind and jobs they were always told they couldn't do. So working in factories, driving trucks, um, working on railroads, putting together planes and tanks and ships, all this tough, physically demanding work that women were always told they weren't capable of, they did and they proved they could do it. And that was one of the reasons why they gained the right to vote um, with the 20th Amendment, with the 19th Amendment, excuse me, in 1920 was because of their efforts. The government almost felt like, hey, women are now have proven themselves. They are owed this right. Um, that was part of the motivation for why that amendment was ratified at that time. Okay, here they are putting together airplane um, engines. Okay, what you work on today goes with chapter 19, section four. Um, I'm gonna give you a little, little introduction to that and then um, I'll explain what you're gonna work on and set you up for later this week. Think about this question before you get to that section. If you're focusing on making sure there's going to be no more war, wars come to an end, what should you do once it's ended? If you don't want it to break out again, should you punish the losers, send a message, don't try and do something like this again? Or should you try to fix the problems that led to the war in the first place? Now again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but I asked this question because there were two different ways of approaching things. Um, when the war was over with, it was mainly four leaders who were making most of the decisions. Um, between January and June of 1918, the American President Woodrow Wilson would meet with these European leaders at the Palace of Versailles outside of Paris, and they were working out what the treaty would say, the treaty with Germany, what it would say ending the war. Now, it's the French leader, the British Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister or President, and President Woodrow Wilson. There are other countries there, but these men, they call them the big four. They ultimately are working out the main parts of the treaty. Now, Woodrow Wilson is someone who believed in what they say was moral diplomacy. He's an idealist. He wants things to be solved through negotiation and compromise, not war. And before the war ended, he really said, we should try to make this a peace without victory. He did not want to punish Germany too harshly. He thought if we punish them badly, they've already been beaten in the war. This will only create more problems, more anger and resentment, and it won't lead to a lasting peace. He had a whole plan in a speech he laid out called the 14 points. I'm not gonna go through all those because you're gonna read about them. But the key one that you should be familiar with is what's called the League of Nations. Wilson said, we should have an organization of countries from all over the world that can meet, that can talk things through so we don't resort to war again in the future. We can guarantee world peace. We can protect weak countries from strong countries. So he says, this will create a kind of a new order in the world. Things based on justice and the rule of law. If that sounds familiar, it's because we have something just like that now. It's not called the League of Nations, it's called the United Nations. But this was an earlier version of that. This was to be created long before the United Nations. This is at the end of World War One. The United Nations won't be created until the end of World War II. But this was the idea that came from Woodrow Wilson. Now, European nations felt very differently. France, Great Britain, they had suffered because of German attacks. When they looked at Germany, they saw this crazed monster that was looking to take over the world. They really wanted to make sure that Germany could never attack them again. And they wanted revenge. They wanted punishment. Remember, Wilson didn't feel the same way. You know, this war was not fought on American soil. The U.S. only fought for the last year. So our president in the United States as a nation didn't have motivation to punish the Germans the same way these other European countries did. They want Germany to be held accountable for all the damage that was caused, and they want to make sure Germany can never take any aggressive action against them again. They even call for a buffer zone, an area where no German military can exist between France and Germany the French felt like they'd have more security and protection from future German attacks. They also want to enrich themselves from this war, take away colonies that used to belong to Germany, um, increase their own wealth and power. Many people looked at the treaty that was signed at the end and said, it looks like Germany is being forced to swallow a very big pill that it can't really swallow. Now, typically in class, I would have had you done this 
do this uh, peace treaty simulation, but we won't do that. Obviously, we're not in class. So if you take a look at chapter 19, section 4 in the book, it's called Wilson Fights for Peace. You're going to read that section. Um, you'll see the online version of the book. It's not too much reading. There's a little organizer that goes with it. It's only, I think, six questions. And um, you'll learn about what Wilson's 14 points were, um, the debate about this treaty, what the treaty actually says and how tough it is on Germany some things that cause problems, why the U.S. never actually signs the treaty ourselves, and then how that treaty at the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, might lead to problems in the future. Remember, during World War I, Germany is not led by Hitler. He's the leader during World War II. But he was a soldier who fought in this war. Somebody who was very angered by how Germany was humiliated and devastated and vowed to get revenge. So some people believe, some historians believe, one of the reasons he's able to take over is because of the failures of this treaty, the Treaty of Versailles that comes at the end of World War I. But you'll read more about that, okay? Make sure the notes you fill in and that organizer you submit that through Verge. And then I'm probably gonna have you do the following day, take a look at the Brain Pop video about World War I. I think it's a very good summary of the things you need to know, some of the key ideas. And like I said at the start, Later this week, either Wednesday or Thursday, I'll have a quiz uploaded just based on things you should know about imperialism and World War I. All right? That's all I wanted for today. As always, if you have questions, shoot me a message through Verge or send me an email, and I'll make sure I get back to you as soon as possible. Otherwise, have a great day.